Welcome to the analysis.news podcast. In Iraq, the new government must deal with the COVID crisis, a growing protest movement, and a threat from a reorganized ISIS. The newly elected prime minister is said to have been acceptable to both Iran and the United States. Trump's bellicose attitude towards Iran might again embroil Iraq in U.S. machinations in the region. Now joining us to analyze the situation in Iraq and around Iraq is Professor Sabah al-Nasiri. He's born in Basra, Iraq, and earned his doctorate in Frankfurt, Germany. Sabah teaches Middle East politics at the Department of Politics at York University in Toronto. Thanks for joining us, Sabah. Good to be with you, Paul. First of all, how is the uh, COVID pandemic affecting Iraq? And uh, and I assume the economy is to some extent closed down. Right. Uh, and 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 so in countries that have so, you know, such a weak healthcare system, and particularly Iraq ravaged by war, I think there was a much better healthcare system under Saddam than there probably is now. Right. So so how are they dealing with all this? Well, luckily, I don't know. I can't explain it. I mean, the rate is very low compared to other countries. But is that just because there's not there's not much testing going on? Maybe, yeah, maybe. But but uh, even the death rate is very low. I mean, um, the, the the mistake um, was at the beginning uh, when Iraq, Iraq kept the border to Iran open. They didn't shut down the border, although they knew, you know, there was a high rate of infections and so on in Iran. So it, it moved from Iran to Iraq at that time. And uh, after that, the government shut down the border and then things um get better they get you know situation to control but still you as you said maybe because they don't have any statistic they don't uh, do testing at we don't know the scope of the of the pandemic in iraq but generally and the region like if i look at jordan kuwait uh, iraq etc syria um, even yemen um, it is uh, remarkably less than other countries, let's say in Iran or Turkey, the border country. Mm. And is there any explaining that? They tried. I mean, after the first few days when they kept the border open and then they realized there's a problem, they start taking the, the, the right approach. And remarkably, the people really um, collaborated with the government. They stayed home despite you know, the, the crisis, despite lack of resources, despite lack of survival, like a, the biggest chunk of the Iraqi population li live from day to day. So if they don't actually work for the day, they cannot survive. But still, they, you know, they, they cooperated with the government. They stayed home. They And the most remarkable, remarkable thing was not from the government, but from the people themselves. People start, especially activists, start organizing uh, food, uh, um, logistics, and so on for the families in need in all the provinces of Iraq. And that worked very well. It supported, you know, millions of people who couldn't survive otherwise. I would think that there's probably lack of reporting on deaths connected with COVID, given there's so much lack of reporting that even in some of the more advanced countries, especially the United States, and right. even Canada is just catching up with, with the, the stats. Right. Though in Iraq, I mean, especially because of the, um, you can say the, 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 the religious dimension of it, uh, there are two ways, uh, uh, Islamically speaking, of the, either the Shiite or the Sunni way. So it is very obvious if people are not, you know, um, buried in, 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 the, in these two ways, there's something wrong here, something suspicious. So as pe people start documenting how COVID-19 affected um, the people or the, the you know died on COVID nineteen, how they were buried. So they documented it because they had to be very cautious how and how to do this. So I think they cannot hide the death rate, but they can hide the infection rate because they don't do testing. Tell us a bit about who this new prime minister is, what the new government is, and what is the alignment of forces. Right. So as you know, Paul, since ever since uh, Adil Abdel Mahdi, the ex uh, prime minister, resigned on November 29th, 2019, almost seven months, the, um, the governing parties, they didn't manage to bring uh, a, a candidate. So they nominated a few of them, but they were immediately rejected by the Tahrir Square, by the people on the streets. 
despite the pressure from uh, sometimes Iran and uh, at other times the U.S., they could not pass these candidates. Uh, and even the, the president of the, of the republic hesitated to accept this nomination because he knew if he would have nominated them to the, you know, the post of the minister president, he would have the whole streets against uh, the, the the president. When we say streets, who's in those streets? What what are the political forces that are in the streets? Yeah, I'll, I'll come to that. I'm just saying about the the scope and the the effect of the uh, the protest movement in Iraq throughout the middle and the southern provinces in Iraq, and in the meantime, also in the north of Iraq in Sulaymaniyah, since a few days, a huge protest uh, going on. So I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. But um, this shows the, 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 the inability of nominating uh, a candidate for about six or seven months shows the, the, the depth of the crisis of the governing class, not only the economic crisis, but the political crisis. And al Kalami, the last, I mean, this, the current minister president, was um, a, uh, um, a compromise between actually the U.S. and Iran. And and I called him the um, the de-escalation candidate. His function is to de-escalate the conflict between the U.S. and Iran on the one hand, and between the government and the protest movement in Iraq on the other hand. That's not an easy task to do. He was the head of the um, uh, counterintelligence of Iraq for years. He knew actually uh, who. Uh, killed and incarcerated and tortured and kidnapped the, the the protesters, and that's a card I think he is using against, especially the militias, and some of them are backed by Iran, who committed these crimes. I think he's using this 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 file against these militias to calm them down to de-escalate. Uh, from the attack, let's say, on the U.S. So he's playing this card. Um, mm-hmm. uh, to de-escalate the conflict and to prepare the ground for some sort of negotiation, indirect negotiation between the U.S. and Iran. And the reason why I think they both accepted the Kabami because both the U.S. and Iran are going through hard times. The Trump administration going through hard times of you know containing the protest movement in the U.S. due to the calling of uh, actually the assassination of George Floyd, and at the same time, uh, the election. And Iran is going through a, a harsh economic crisis due to the sanctions and also some protests since November last year. So the regime there faces two, two sorts of crises. One, uh, economic, and the se- second one is political within Iran but also setbacks in Iraq and Lebanon and Syria against, um, um, you know, forces, political forces, military forces, militias supported by Iran. There's a setback and uh, and protest against them. So both the U.S. and Iran were in, you know, in need of, 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 of a figure that helped to de-escalate the situation and set up the stage for some sort of indirect uh, negotiation between the two. Now, if you want to, if you want me to go back to the political forces uh, on the streets, I can I can say something about that. Yeah, please do. Yes, so we can we can say, I mean, generally speaking, in the way I observe it, we have three type of forces. The first one is the spontaneous, youth-driven movement throughout the middle and the southern provinces of Iraq, from Baghdad up to uh, down to Basra. Most of these young um, uh, people are either from a extremely uh, poor working class fa- families, or they are graduate, uh, you know, especially in higher education, uh, who can't find a job since years, even though they graduated since years, and some of them, you know. Uh, with doctorate and so on, and, and, and some exceptional candidates among them, but they can't find a job due to the corruption uh, within the state institution. So if you look at the state institution, civil or military alike, you will see most of the employees there are hired by the political parties or the militias, not due to their experience or skills, etc., just because of their affiliation with these parties and militias. And that's why the, the, you can see the, um, the, the, the public institutions are in, in, in a desperate situation. There is no efficiency. There is no 
uh, experience there. So there's a lack of services on all levels. You, so that's the, fir- the first force, and the majority of them are actually were not politicized before. Uh, though some of them, you know, joined the protest movement in 2017, 2014, but generally they were not politicized through parties or some currents or some or um, um, religious figure, etc. So that's the biggest force on the ground, and it is mostly, to put it in in, in, in neutral terms, it's a secular in its orientation. It's, it's both against the political system and corruption at the same time against the, the dominance of religion and sect on the political economic scene in Iraq. That's the first force. The second one is a, mostly driven by the religious figure as sadr Muhtad al-Sadr, his supporters. He has a lot of supporters in Iraq. And to the biggest part of the, of the protests, which I call the October Revolution, because it starts in October last year, until January, actually, they were supportive of the protesters and actually protecting them from other militias, etc. But then, by the end of January, especially after the uh, the killing of Soleimani and Mohandas, Iran lost its um, um, influence in Iraq because Mohandas and Soleimani were both the one who controlled the militias and political, Shia political parties in Iraq. They organized and negotiate candidates, they, um, you know, mostly intervene in the in the political decision-making in Iraq. So both were killed. So Iran was in need of a new figure to fill the gap, and they, they picked Muqtad al-Sadr. Now, once they picked Muqtad al-Sadr to pursue Iran interests within Iraq, there was a conflict between Iran interests within Iraq and the protest movement in Iraq. And you saw this by the end of January, when Alawi... Uh, the, 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 one of the candidates was nominated for the minister presidency, supported by Sadr. The protest movement on the street in Tahrir Square were against this candidate. So there was a conflict between the Sadrists and the, 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 the secular current, and there were clashes on the street. Some of the protesters were killed and so on. So there was a fallout between the Sadrist movement and the protest movement ever since January. And still, you can see the conflicts going on. Not so much as it was in January, but still, you can see the conflict there. Now, when you're talking about Sadr, we know for years he's been the head of a very big movement amongst the Shia. Uh, but in, if you're if you're saying there's now a contradiction between the Sadr movement and the protest movement, what organizations are there of this protest movement? Uh, you said it's young workers and such, but they must be organized, or are they not? Yes, they are. They are. They are organized at the, you can say, at the province level. So each province, let's say Basra, has its own coordination committee. And and this coordination committee um, organized within the province, but also across provinces with other um, committees in other provinces in Iraq, in Masriya, Baghdad, Najaf, Karbala, etc. And there's also, beside these uh, uh, um, coordination committees, there are uh, groups of, uh, you know, uh, politician, intellectual, um, uh, civil rights um, uh, figures who also um, organize and be a public voice of this protest movement throughout the, the country. So there's uh, some sort of organization, although there's a lack of leadership. And that's one of the problems I talked about many times uh, on Twitter uh, with the activists that I was saying that, you know, the demands to have an, an early election, demands to have a election law, a demands to have a party law, etc., doesn't make sense if the, if the protesters um, doesn't, you know, form a political party that represent the people and join this new election within this new uh, framework of a party law and try to win a majority in the, in the election and then, you know, perform the constitution, etc. But you cannot demand election and party laws, etc. and you refuse to form a political party of some sort of political mm-hmm. organization. I think the reason why, uh, until now, at least until now, things are getting to change now, because uh, I'm working on this since since month, uh, until now, I can understand why more, uh, the absolute majority of these young people 
uh, were against uh, political parties because when they see all the political parties in Iraq, be them Kurds or Shiite or Sunni, you name them, they are all corrupt. They are all, you know, represent either themselves and some sort of cliques and clans uh, around them, or they represent interests from outside of the country, regionally or internationally. They pursue regional or international agenda. So uh, the, the, the term political party and the term leadership has a negative connotation within the protest movement until now. I think now things start to change. But that was one, uh, one uh, obvious thing that made it easy, easily uh, to the governing uh, class and the militias to um, at time contain or suppress the movement because there was no strong leadership that you know set up the stage for um, transforming the movement from what I call a civil society um, to a political movement, to a political society. This is lacking until now. But I think things are shifting toward this movement from civil to political society. What is going on with the Iraqi economy? I mean, it's, it's, it was primarily an oil-based economy. The price of oil has tanked. How much is there of economic activity outside of oil? And now with the COVID crisis, many countries have practically had to close down production. Uh, as you said, most people are living day to day and, and can't do that. But still, what what is there to live on there? Right. I mean, this is the tragedy of Iraq because, on the one hand, of course, you know, uh, the effect of the of the of the um, of oil prices was so much that they didn't even um, or but, uh, actually postponed the budget of 2020 to 2021 because they they projected, I think, something like fifty fifty six dollar per a barrel um, in the 2020 budget, but then the price went down to $10 or something like that. So there was an 80% uh, gap in, in the budget. But that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem of Iraq, I would say the tragedy, actually Iraq can survive even without oil. I mean, the agriculture in Iraq alone can feed the whole country. And the, the other resources Iraq has, like for instance, Iran has, I think, the seventh um, reserve of gas in the world, but they don't use it. They, they import gas from Iran. They import even oil from Iran. They don't process it in Iraq. They process it in Iran. And that's because of corruption, corruption and the affili- affiliation of the Shiite political party with Iran that uh, opened up the space uh, in Iraq for uh, trade and finance and agriculture and so on for Iranian export to Iraq, would destroy the, the the infrastructure in Iraq since years. And again, for instance, along the, the border, um, the custom tariffs and so on in Iraq, uh, is, 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 um, it could be more than one-fifth of the budget of, uh, of Iraq, but yet it is controlled by political parties, be, this, be that in Kurdistan, or in the south by Shiite political parties and militias, each one of them control one of these border and, and uh, appropriate the, the income of the revenue of custom revenues. So there is a wide, you know, structurally institutionalized corruption that plunder the wealth of the nation and, and drives the absolute majority of the population uh, below the poverty line. So that's the tragedy of Iraq, because Iraq can actually survive even without oil. But because of the corruption and the and the and the, the, the depletion of the of the of the country's resources, people live almost a forty percent under the poverty line, and, uh, and and the employment I, I estimated by forty to forty five percent, especially among the young people. So they, you have uh, since years a, a polarized society. On the one hand, you have a minority of extremely rich uh, figure of uh, some political parties or militias who owns billion of dollars. And on the other hand, the absolute majority of the population, and that applies to the South, but also in the North, in Kurdistan, to the Kurds, who live either on or be, uh, below the, uh, the, the poverty line. And that's the biggest strategy of Iraq. And now when um, COVID-19 hits and imposed restriction on, uh, on the movement of people, most of the people, especially in the south, in the so-called Shiite provinces, and that's the tragedy, you know, you have a, an executive dominated by Shiite political party, yet the Shiite population 
in the southern countries are the poorest in the country. And the Shiite political parties and militia are the richest in the country. You didn't have it under Saddam Hussein or Abdul Karim Qasim or, or, the, or, or the king until 1958. And that's the tragedy for the Shiite society in Iraq, that those who represent them are the most corrupt in the history of Iraq. And, and that's why people were outraged after a few days because they couldn't go and um, go about their everyday uh, living. And the government was not supporting them. And thanks to the activists, these young people who are themselves poor, but they organized donation from, you know, well-off families or some religious institution or from some, you know, uh, merchant and so on who donated foods and clothes and so on to those, uh, to those poor people. And these young activists organized the logistic to support these families. And now I think that the protest planned to the start now, but it will go on mostly by the end of the month, will be even more intense and more wider in scope than the, the few months before, because now you have, be, beside these unemployed young graduates or working class kids, you have these so-called informal informal sectors, uh, families who uh, survived on everyday life, but their you know, existence, um, existence was destroyed by the COVID-19 and lack of support of the of government. That's why I expect even more intense and, and, and uh, uh, wide protest within the next few days and weeks in Iraq. What are the demands of the protesters? Well, at the beginning, uh, you can say the demand was m- mostly service-oriented against corruption and so on. But because the government of, of Abdel Mahdi reacted, you know, in a brutal and a violent way against, against these protesters, they have snipers at the beginning uh, of the revolution in October. They have snipers over the building shooting these young uh, kids, 16, 17, 18s in their head, shoot to kill. That brought the whole protest movement to a higher level. Now they start asking for and not only end of corruption, but end of the regime. They don't want the political parties. They don't want the government. They don't want the parliaments. They want a new constitution with a new uh, um, uh, governing structure. And uh, so they became radicalized. And that put enormous pressure on the governing class or governing cliques in Iraq and their militias because they were not expecting this. Why? Because they get used to protest movement ever since 2004 and five that goes on for a few days and ask for some sort of services, and that's it. But this time, it was different. And the fact that it's still going on since almost now, since October, we are in month eight, this is something they never dealt with before. They don't know how to deal with it. And that drove them to this organic crisis. They are in an organic crisis. And I think uh, if things go on the way I expect them to go, we will, might expect a radical change in Iraq within the next few months. What size are these protests? Well, uh, as, as I said, um, I mean, at the beginning, you can see uh, small groups in Tahrir Square, Liberation Square, throughout the provinces in Iraq, protesting mostly either lo- locally or provincially against, let's say, the mayor or against the governor of the province or against some sort of uh, civil servants, etc. But then because of the brutal um, uh, reaction of the government and also the provinces, the, the, the province councils with their militias against the, the protesters, the, 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 the number um, uh, and the quality of the protest increase um, uh, uh, proportionally. So at one at some stages, you have millions of people on the streets in Iraq, especially in Tahrir Square. I mean, the, just before COVID-19, COVID-19, especially when the student movement joined the protest movement, it gave them an enormous um, push and a number and scope or, and also the quality of the protest movement. So you have uh, um, now uh, what I called, you know, the nucleus of uh, civil societies in Iraq. You, and the Tahrir Square became like a small state where you have healthcare, social benefits, education, um, all sort of the, you know, tasks that normally the public sector or the state perform, these activists were performing in the Tahrir Square. That attracted so many people, especially poor families, who are not, you know, part of the movement, or maybe not affected by the policies of the government because some of them were um, 
affiliated with these political parties or religious institutions, and yet they joined the movement because they saw in it, you know, an alternative, better alternative. And and so I believe that now, with the biggest, you know, um, uh, social categories within the Iraqi uh, population, especially the, the work class population, those who live from day to day, you know, live on subsistence economy, they will definitely join the, the protest movement now. And that's why the, the government and the militias and the uh, security apparatus they are taking so, uh, you know, preemptive measure, kidnapping and arresting some uh, prominent candidates and figures of protest movement to intimidate the people not to join and not to protest. In the past, the Communist Party of Iraq was one of the largest parties in the country. The trade unions were strong and had, uh, even after the fall of the uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, the trade unions had a lot to say. And I remember stories about the trade unions opposing privatization and such. How, of, to what extent did this, does this protest movement have a socialist character in its demands? Well, I, won't, I wouldn't say socialist. It's still, you can say social democratic demands. Social justice, you know, health care for, for, for all, education for all, employment for all, also, and social democratic demand. And different unions, be them the lawyers or workers, especially in the oil industry or the teacher unions, and so all of them supported the protest movement. And and and, and especially the, 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 the lawyer syndicate, I must say, they played a, a, a significant role uh, legally speaking, by defending the protesters and trying to release them from incarcerations uh, for free. So uh, the unions are playing a positive role um, uh, from, from the beginning of the movement, supporting the movements. And uh, especially in the oil sector, and especially in the South, in Basra, the oil um, um, and, uh, <clears throat> union supported the protesters. Um, but as I, as I said, I mean, this COVID-19 since March, uh, you know, throw the, the movement a bit uh, backwards. Uh, but I believe that it will regain momentum within the... And st- actually starts since yesterday, uh, the protesters went on to the high square and they went to the, you know, to the, to the governing council in the provinces. They they occupied houses and the, and, 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 and the province councils and so on because they want to escalate now. And that's one of the things I was saying because next week we'll have a, a, a strategic negotiation between the Trump administration and Iraq, the Iraqi government on, on June 10th. And I was advising activists in Iraq to escalate the protest because if they don't, the, the, the negotiation will be behind the back of the, of the revolution and Iraq will pay the price for the de-escalation between the US and Iran. Not Iran, not the US, Iraq will pay the price. So I was saying for for the revolution to be a, a difficult number in this equation and to impose itself on the negotiation without being uh, uh, on the negotiation table, they have to escalate and, and show visibilities on the streets uh, throughout the provinces so that if the U.S. team come to Iraq to negotiate with the Iraqi government, they cannot um, you know, ignore the presence of the revolution in Iraq it has to be, um, a, you know, a means of pressure to um, uh, set up some, the stage for some demands of the revolution to be fulfilled by this government. What are they negotiating? What does the United States want? Yes. I mean, it happened uh, a few months ago when Iran um, allied parties and militias pushed for a a law within the, 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 the parliament to ask the executive that, uh, the, that the U.S. troops should withdraw from Iraq. So that, you know, uh, started the, the, the whole thinking about uh, renewing the strategic agreement between Iraq and the United States. There's one from 2008 and 9, and another one from 2018. So they want to renegotiate it again because... Uh, what happens after the, uh, you know, they, um, um, 
they pushed this law through the, 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 the parliament. There were a few attacks from these militias on U.S. military bases, uh, but also on the U.S. embassy, etc. So they, they tried to escalate the conflict with, with the U.S. troops in, the United, in Iraq. So that pushed the United States and the Iraqi government now to renegotiate these strategic agreements. And of course, it's not only military, it's political, it's uh, economic, etc. And I think that these are a golden opportunity for the revolution uh, to be utilized by the revolutionaries to push for their own agenda this time and don't let the field you know, be occupied just by the U.S. negotiators and the Iraq one and behind door Iran. Because the whole negotiation, the way I see it, is indirectly between the U.S. and Iran to de-escalate at least until the election and give Iran some sort of concession. And one of these concessions Iran was uh, doing, you know, the release of the of uh, what is Michael White a few days ago was, um, you know, um, incarcerated for some, some something like 683 days. That's you know a gesture from Iran to to the Trump administration to re- to negotiate and and give some concession to Iran. So I was saying we shouldn't lay, let them play this game in Baghdad at the cost of the revolution. The revolution should be a major player in these negotiations. The Iranians, I can see, might want to de-escalate. But a lot of people think the Americans might want to escalate. They may want a real provocation with Iran before the election so Trump can be his wartime president. Um, I don't think so, because the, the U.S. pushed for al-Qaeda. And al Khadami was accepted by Iran, of course. They pushed for al Khadami precisely what I called, even before he was nomin- nominated, I was, I was saying this is a government of de-escalation. Because like a few months before the election, things might get out of, con- out of control of the United States. And they don't want to take this risk. They want to de-escalate within Iraq and with Iran, and at least until the, the, the end of the election. And that why, that's why Iran also accepted al Khadami. Iran thinks al Khadami is much closer to the U.S. than to Iran. But they accepted al Khadami with the assumption that he will de-escalate. And, and he's, ever since he was you know, nominated, uh, he's, he's trying to de-escalate. Within Iraq, with the, with the so-called al Hashdi Shabi, the, popul- uh, the, 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 the popularization, the mobilization, mobilization uh, um, units, al hajj shabi and with the militias, but also with the protesters on the street, on the one hand, and between Iran and the U.S. And I think both of them, they want to use this opportunity, this three months, to, to have some concession, sort of concession, uh, towards Iran and the United States. al al Khadami can organize this. And that's why I'm saying that it is a golden opportunity for the revolution, because neither the U.S. nor Iran want to escalate now. So if the revolution escalates, it will you know, uh, put it help, uh, itself as a difficult number on this negotiating table and it, it pressure all of them to take the demand of the revolution seriously if they want to de-escalate. When uh, Trump p- pulled back support for the Kurds in uh, Syria and on the, near, near the Turkish border, uh, what what has actually happened? It's It was so at the forefront of the news and now it's kind of disappeared from North American news. I I believe, and we can see it recently. I believe that the deal was that Russia will, you know, have um, the most say in Syria, and for that, the U.S. but also Iran should have less presence in in, in Syria. So the Russians were pushing now for some changes and reform within Syria. And I heard the last few days, they were even asking Bashar al-Assad to, to resign um, and push back again against also Iran president in Syria. So, and I think that was the compromise between the US and Russia uh, and Israel in, indirectly that there should be less Iranian president in Syria. And that's what they're doing now. And that opened up the space actually for the protest in, in Lebanon and, and, and in Iraq, if you, if, you, if you recall, the protest movement in Lebanon and Iraq started almost at the same time in October last year, and it's still going on. And, and, and uh, unfortunately or tragically, last night and um, night before, there were clashes in Beirut, and, and I think one activist were, was killed, etc. Uh, so you have uh, opening up 
of this political space in Lebanon uh, and Iraq to to ask for a, a radical reform against this so-called muhasasa system, which is sectarian-based uh, power sharing formula in Lebanon and Iraq. And 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 here I, I can see the the change within Syria and Lebanon and Iraq. If it if it, if it goes this way, that the, the power sharing formula of muhasasa collapses, and instead maybe a much more representative regime established. Then Iran will lose its influence in, 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 in this region. What happened to the Kurdish fighters and the the community? They had a very leftist character to them. There was a lot of predictions there would be a real slaughter. But what happened? I can I can assure you. Um, I mean, I don't know this yet, but we will see it probably next week when we have the negotiation next week in Baghdad on June tenth between the U.S. and Iraq. I can assure you. Some representative of the Kurdish movement in Syria would be also present in Iraq. Because I think the U.S. want to approach it this way. Not only they want to contain or push back a bit against the influence of Iran in Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. So that means in order to do that, they want some sort of coordination between Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. And that's why I think representative of the Kurdish movement, especially on the security military side, will be present at the strategic negotiation next week in Iraq. We will see. I I just, you know, um, assume this, but I think it has, um, you know, a lot of factual um, truth to it because the U.S. cannot, you know, uh, pursue its strategy in Iraq alone. It has to do it within this context of Syria, Iraq, Iran, and by, by extension, Lebanon. What happened with the Turkish attack on the Kurds? Did the Kurds pull back? Were they able to resist it? Well, I mean, it, 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 Turkey is pushing forward not only in in, 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 uh, uh, in northern Syria, but also shows presence in northern Iraq. You can see also Turkish troops in northern Iraq. So they want to create some sort of corridor between Syria or Iraq and Turkey to cut off the Kurds from there with the Kurds in, 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 in Turkey. And, uh, of course, that there was uh, a lot of pushback against the Kurdish forces in Syria. They were pushed out from the border cities. And um, and I think the U.S. tried to uh, incorporate them now within this overall strategic negotiation in Iraq to probably uh, work for some sort of aut- autonomy, just like the, the Kurds in Iraq and Syria. And that cannot be done without also the, the um, negotiation with Turkey, too. But that would be the second step, not the first one. So, so just concretely, the the Kurds were under Turkish attack, and there was a lot of question about whether they could resist it. Would would they have to withdraw? So, what what exactly happened? Well, the the, the Kurds were pushed from the northwest border between Turkey and Syria to the to the northeast and southwards. Um, because Turkey wanted this area, the northwest, to have a, a, a corridor between Turkey and Syria. So the Kurds moved eastwards and east-southwards. And the U.S., of course, and they tried to try to uh, renegotiate with the, with, the, with the Assad government um, to have some sort of uh, um, unified force to push against Turkey, but it didn't materialize. Well, the U.S. tried to now use these forces, A, against uh, ISIS in Syria, uh, especially at the border between Iraq and Syria, to, to engage them against ISIS, which they did. But at the same time, they w- they want to as uh, include them in this wider strategy of the U.S. and Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon against Iran. And I think what they are working for, or, or you know, the scenario would be similar to Iraq, where you have some sort of autonomy for the Kurds in, in Syria, similar in Kurdistan, Iraq. So I, I don't think things will ex- escalate further between Turkey and the Kurds, as long as the Turks control this corridor uh, area on the northwest um, um, of, of Syria. Uh, but, you know, I don't know. I mean, things might shift uh, due to some other type of conflict. And Turkey, sh- too, shows some sort of military presence in northern Iraq, too in order to cut off the, the, the support or the movement of this uh, Kurd in Syria to Iraq, because, you know, they moved in Syria and Iraq, and especially the PKK. 
So to try, to, the Turks tried to have a corridor from the northwest of Iraq to, um, to the northwest of Syria and push the coast uh, downwards in a way. Well, let's talk again after this. Uh, these negotiations take place in Baghdad. Yes. And I think they are they are uh, significant for the few months, at least for the lot for the next three months to come, both for the U.S. and Iran, but also and above all, what you know, what I'm interested in in the October Revolution in Iraq. They, the revolution can maneuver and utilize these moments to push, you know, uh, forward with its radical agenda. And I think there are good. Um, chances that's not everything, but you know, biggest chunk of this agenda can be materialized under under this current government because it needs, as I said, it needs some sort of de-escalation in order to push through with this negotiation uh, until the whatever planned election next year. Thanks for joining us, Saba. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us on the Analysis.News podcast. Mm-hmm.